Hi, I'm Keiichi Fujiwara. I'm an IGCS president, and uh, happy to be here uh, to declare that IGCS and our advocacy network to declare that June is the awareness month of the uterine can cancer. So um, thank you for joining us for virtually and in person today. So this is a global initiative, and we hope to, to spread more awareness of this disease worldwide. So here on the panel today, uh, Ms. Mary Aiken, our CEO, IGCS CEO, and Dr. Brian Slombit, who is a G1 oncologist, who is working for uh, the uterine cancer for a long time, and uh, Ms. Natafari. Natafari. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the two times uh, uterine cancer survivor, and Dr. Keta Lorosso, who is a, the, another uh, uterine cancer specialist today. So, uh, Mary, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how this came about? Sure. Thank you, KG. We've noticed that there's been such success in awareness campaigns throughout many of the uh, medical diseases, colon, breast, cervical, ovarian, and what was missing to us most uh, uh, recently at IGCS is uterine cancer. And with the incidence of the disease rising, mortality on the rise, we felt that having a dedicated month towards uterine cancer would help bring awareness and drive some of the information that's out there for patients uh, at risk or ha uh, having the disease. We started looking at other advocacy groups, and there are a lot of advocacy groups out there doing great work in this space, but we felt IGCS could be the voice to amplify the work that's happening currently. We have over 25 advocacy partners joining us in this campaign and this effort this month. This is the year that IGCS is thinking big, and we believe June as Uterine Cancer Awareness Month is big. So when the idea came about, the IGCS board under Kichi's direction supported this. We want to make sure that all women all over the world know about this, and we're excited that you're here today to help us kick off June as Uterine Cancer Awareness Month. Isn't that right, Kichi? Yes, uh, certainly it is. This is a really, really big idea. So I, th I think it is time to make uterine cancer a global priority, and IGCS is the, the best group to lead this initiative. So um, there has been a lot of great research happening and uh, recently in the uterine cancer care, and that the, it, it is helping us to better understand about the disease and to improve their, the outcome of the treatment. So there are a lot to, to, to talk about. So now I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Slomvitz could you uh, lead uh, the, the, the rest of the, the, the campaign? And uh, do you mind leading us for of this? Of course. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And, you know, for me, I'm honored and humbled to, um, to be a part of this initiative and to really be selected to help lead this initiative. I think it's, it's something that's long overdue. It's something that our patients and their families deserve. Um, and it's something that I do believe we can make great changes moving forward in order to help um, awareness this is of this disease, which in turn will help prevent cases of uterine cancer, and for those women who are suffering, help them live longer, ultimately, through awareness, through research, and through those types of initiatives. Um, I'm Brian Slomovitz. I'm a director of gynecologic oncology at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, and I also serve as a uterine cancer clinical trial lead for the GOG Foundation, which is the leading organization here in the U.S. Um, who does, we do clinical research in gynecologic cancers, and I'm also humbled to, be, um, to have that position as well. Um, this is a big idea. This is important. This is a global initiative. We're sitting here now in Chicago, but this is a worldwide initiative. And obviously, working with the IGCS and its leadership, um, we're the right organization. We're an inclusive organization. This is not our initiative. This is an initiative that we're bringing groups together, as Mary alluded to, over 25 groups. We're bringing them together to help us come forward and help us raise awareness. We want the groups to claim ownership of this. We don't want to say, this is our initiative, join us. We want to say, work with us, and we'll join you to support your local groups. Um, this is worldwide. We're involved in Europe, in Asia, um, really throughout the world and throughout the, uh, the Americas. So we're really excited about that. 
There's so much that we have to highlight. We want this to be a sustainable event. We need to make awareness 12 months a year, but really highlighted this year. But we want to talk about in five and 10 years, talk about the successes that we've had based on this initiative. A couple of important points. Um, over 400,000 women worldwide get uterine cancer. It's a worldwide disease. Over almost 100,000 deaths each year worldwide due to this disease. In the United States, uterine cancer is the most common gynecologic cancer. Okay, and not only that, and this is what most people are, will be surprised to hear, we're, the number of cancer deaths due to uterine cancer soon are gonna outnumber our current deadliest cancer, ovarian cancer. So soon, not only is it the most common, but we're gonna see more deaths from uterine cancer in the US than any other gynecologic cancer. So the time that we need to act is now. Along those lines, it would be unfair if we didn't mention that across diversities, the disease acts differently. And there's no other way to say this, but black women are twi who have endometrial cancer, uterine cancer, are twice as likely to die from their disease than other races. So not only do we need to come up with better treatment options and better awareness for this disease, but in fact we need to do it across all different populations among different groups so we can better recognize what is the best treatment for black women, what is the best treatment for white patients, for, for Hispanic patients, because we believe there are differences, whether it's in the biology of the disease or in their response to differences, to, to, in their response to treatments, there clearly are differences and, and, and we need to address those in our black, Hispanic, Asian communities as well. Um, what, a couple of things, we talk about the incidence, how it's increasing. It's a preventable disease. There are some what we call modifiable risk factors that can help us prevent seeing our loved ones suffer from this disease. Number one, obesity. Unfortunately, we see that obesity is a huge problem here in the United States and, and worldwide. Um, it's something that we really need to address. Um, without getting too technical, fat tissue can convert into estrogen. That increased estrogen is a driving force biologically to create endometrial cancers. So pre why preventable? If we decrease obesity, we could in turn decrease the amount of deaths and the amount of cases of endometrial cancer, which will yield a decreased deaths from this disease. Um, other risk factors that we see, hereditary. We know women who have a family history of colorectal cancer, totally different cancer, but if there's a family history of colorectal cancer, um, those women should be tested for hereditary mutations. Again, doing a hysterectomy can prevent this cancer. Other, uh, other modifiable risk factors as well. I'm speaking too much before I turn it over to my esteemed colleagues. You know, the, the purpose of this campaign is threefold. Threefold. Number one, to teach our medical college edu through education more about this disease so we can offer the best treatment options for our patients. Secondly, we need to teach our, uh, to, to educate our patients and make them more well, our patients, their families, and even most importantly, the populations that we serve. There are some inherent barriers that people don't want to come for medical care across disparities. There's a lack of trust in medical care. We need to help educate communities to over, overcome those barriers. Not the traditional way of holding a conference necessarily at a hospital, but going out to the churches, going out to the community centers to educate and to make aware the, our populations aware. Um, third, and equally as importantly, we understand that research helps to cure cancer. So we need to increase, um, we make, need to make our governments more aware of this disease. We need to, bottom line, get more funding in order for us to do, um, to, to, to come up with trials to help this disease. And this is where we, it's really a global initiative. We have a great um, opportunity. We work with our European colleagues, with our Brazilian colleagues, um, Korean colleagues, and our Asian and our Japanese colleagues. We come together, we come up with the right questions through re research, and we answer those questions. And hand in hand with that is raising the, f the, the funds in order for us to do the research. So. Um, we're, th those are really the, the, the sticking points here, and those are the things that we want to do through this month. Now, I'm honored, humbled, and um, really thrilled that uh, we have one of our, uh, my, my, my close friends and colleagues here from, um, right now she's in Rome, Keta LaRusso, yeah. who's uh, an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Catholic University. Um, she is a, a world leader in research, um, and, I, and she's going to comment a little bit on what we currently have learned and directions that we're going into. Keta, thank you for being here. No, Brian, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here and to participate to this great global initiative. 
we are living an unprecedented moment in endometrial cancer treatment. For several years, we consider uterine cancer as a be benign prognosis tumor and we disinvest in clinical research and treatment and as a consequence this is the only gynecological malignancies in this moment with increased incidence as mortality as Mary said but the, the when we read the, the genomic profile of the tumor we discovered that endometrial cancer is not a single disease but at least four different tumors which will require in the coming year different treatment. And in particular, there is a subgroup of endometrial cancer which present a characteristic that we will call genomic instability. And this pushed the tumor to respond very well to immunotherapy. And a few months ago at SGO meeting, they were presented the results of two trials combining immunotherapy plus chemotherapy in the first line setting of advanced disease and really, really amazing results. When we combine immunotherapy with chemotherapy, platinum-based chemotherapy, and the tumor present this genomic instability, we obtain a reduction of 70% of the risk of progression but also when the tumor has not this characteristic, we obtain around 40% of reduction in the risk of progression. And there are some preliminary data suggesting that we not only reduce the risk of progression, but also we increase survival. And this is really an unprecedented moment. For sure, we have to learn much more we need to increase clinical research. Tumors are really heterogeneous. We realize that we have to do it all together. European researcher, US researcher, Japanese researcher, uh, East European. So all together, it's the only way to change the life of our patient. Yeah, no, th uh, thank you so much. And as I mentioned, you're a leader, you, you, you help have led the previous trials, and I know you're leading future trials. You know, <laughs> other things that we're going forward is more specific targeted therapies. The immunotherapy, it's for all women with endometrial cancer. It, and the studies have been positive with immunotherapy, regardless of the, type, you know, the, 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 the subclassification of endometrial cancer. Future studies are going to relook at um, hormonal therapies again. Sure. They're, they're current standard, and we can get better at those. Other, other newer agents that are really going after specific proteins, something called ADCs, a little bit complicated to describe, but a new way of looking at it. And even at the, 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 the ongoing meetings, we're going to see positive results um, looking forward. So, th so it's, the future is bright. There's a, bit, a lot of exciting ways that we could, um, that we're, we're, that we're, we're researching to see if we can do better. Um, I did mention about um, the, 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 the importance of, dis of researching across disparities. Um, one of the things that we know is that in black women, there's a different biologic makeup. So not all, you know, we used to be um, lumpers, now we have to be splitters. Not all endometrial cancers are the same. They have mutations that are more difficult to treat. They are more aggressive and they don't respond to, treat, to treatments as well. So that's why it's important. Now, um, you know, I think we do every, everything that we're doing, we do for our patients. They are part of our leadership. They're part of what, you know, they, they, we go to sleep at night thinking how we could help our patients live longer, ultimately. And we can't do what we do without our patients. Nefertari is here. Um, I was so pleased today to learn that Nefertari is from Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, I was born right next door in Bayonne, so we, we're uh, some, some things in common there. But um, really, you know, th first of all, thank you for being here. It's not easy to Thanks share your story. And I think um, your story we could learn a lot from. So please, I'll turn it over to you. So thank you for having me. And I also want to clarify that I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Oh. I just live in Jersey City, New York. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, um, as a black woman uh, with Lynn syndrome and who have been diagnosed with uh, uterine cancer twice, uh, and then, you know, essentially ovarian cancer, uh, I do know, you know, the importance of um, learning about your diagnosis and you know how treatment should evolve and um, the important of the importance of advocating for yourself I did a lot of that <laughs> the first time you know I was diagnosed I went to the emergency room 
And basically I was dismissed because I guess I didn't fit in a certain category of when, you know, I guess, you know, with the, I had some abnormal bleeding of when that should start or if that the sign of that something is, you know, going on. Um, but I pushed back, you know, I wanted to, you know, know, I know my body. I want to know what's going on. This is abnormal. This is not normal for me to be bleeding this much and at this time and for as long as I was. Uh, so yeah, essentially I did, you know, uh, get further testing after demanding it. Um, no, I didn't think it was cancer. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that something wasn't right. So yeah, um, I didn't fit, like I said, in the age category and then also, uh, also, you know, I felt I was dismissed due to, you know, me being a black and young woman at the time. But um, after a while I got further treatment, you know, I thought, you know, it was very important to advocate for myself and I'm here today. That treatment has, you know, saved my life. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here to be a part of this initiative. So. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you for being here. You're really the best advocate for this. You're, you've been in the trenches. You've suffered the symptoms. You've, you've fought for your care. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, I talked about earlier some of the barriers of making people aware. What, what are your thoughts about this initiative, this awareness initiative, and what can we do as medical professionals to do a better job getting into the communities and educating our, our, our population? Well, I think, first of all, first off, we need to pay attention to our bodies uh, and, you know, and learn what the signs and symptoms uh, uterine cancer can be, uh, and also those our risk factors, um, I think is really important. Um, and even getting into some of the churches, as was mentioned today, uh, in the community centers, uh, even you know barbershops, uh, beauty salons, uh, just you know in those areas where we do have uh, people from uh, different racial backgrounds just to, you know, to raise that awareness, just to get that word out. Because I think because uh, uterine cancer is so underserved, not a lot of people are talking about it. So if we could just get in those communities to talk about it, I think it would make a huge difference. Yeah, no, I um, agree, agree completely. And mm -hmm. um, you said, you, you're so well-spoken when, mm -hmm. when you said that. Um, you know, Keta, as, you know, as a researcher, how, how do you feel that we could do a better job, we need to do a better job, in addressing racial disparities in the clinical trials that we run. Uh, Brian, you are absolutely right. This is a global problem, but still have some racial disparities. It's evident that the incidence and mortality among black women is uh, rising faster with respect to white women. And uh, what we have to understand is why. It's a problem of late diagnosis, uh, most of these tumors are diagnosed in a later stage, present a more aggressive behavior. So it's important to try to understand if it is a problem of access and late diagnosis, or if there is a different biology of the disease that probably requires different treatment and a more personalized approach. This is why it's so important to spread awareness of this tumor across the world because it's important to know your body, it's important to know the disease, it's important to implement clinical research. We are at the beginning of the history. The moment is amazing, we discover a lot of things, but we are at the beginning of history of clinical research and we will answer all these questions and we will provide answer to our patients. Yeah, you know, you're so, you're so right and we really need to um continue to focus and really get better, because we, 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 um, we need to get better, is, is the bottom line. Uh, and we do have a question from the audience, which is appropriate to this t uh, comment. Um, the question is, I'm very interested in clinical research, and it, particularly in black women with gynecologic cancers. Um, what is our vision? They say the GOG's vision, but um, right now we'll speak of us on, uh, on behalf of the panel. What is our vision and mission over the short and long term to address the participation disparities? Um, I'm interested to hear other thoughts. Let me, let me start off in saying um, it's a serious problem. The FDA came out with a statement in April of 2022 basically saying um, to all sponsors who want to get FDA approval for a drug that they need to submit 
a plan, what their plan is to include um, patients from all disparities in their trials and how, in fact, they executed the plan. And, you know, this is what we needed. We, we needed the sponsors to partner with us, um, and we needed the FDA to tell them to, to, to lead this initiative um, a, a, a moving forward. So how are we doing that? Um, we are now working hand-in-hand -hand with, our, with our sponsors, with the groups that um, help support our trials, with our international colleagues, and we're figuring out ways that, that could um, decrease the, the, the anxiety patients have to get onto trials, um, to make them less fearful, to make them more accepting them going to trials, um, which is sort of the, the hard part to solve. But some of the easy parts to solve, you know, um, women who suffer from endometrial cancer, they come from all walks of life, all different socioeconomic um, in, uh, groups that they're in. Uh, we need to help to get the, uh, other disparities on trials. We need to help pay for them to get into the center. They're, they're going to be they're going to be in the cancer centers for eight hours. We need to you know we need to buy them lunch. We need to, they have kids at home. We need to be able to not pay them to do research, but help to cover their costs of a babysitter who's going to need to come in and help take care of their family members. These are the, some of the initiatives that we're working on. Um, Kat, I want to hear from you. What are some of your other thoughts of how we could increase this, in, particularly in your NGOT led trials? Oh, uh we have to face, we have to manage the problem exactly as you what you are doing at the GOG and FDA level. I think it's important to guarantee a minimum number of uh, different uh, rational in a trial because we need to be um, sure that the drug we are approving works across all women, all country, all. Uh, Races, uh, and it's important to guarantee a minimum number, at least a threshold, of number of different uh, racial representative in each trial. And another important point, uh, Brian, is about awareness and education. Because sometimes it's difficult uh, to be sure that all women uh, are educated about symptoms, uh, possibility of treatment. It's not only a problem of colleagues, it's a problem of patient awareness. And this is the only way, in my opinion, no patient should be left behind. Yes. I, I, I love that. It's, it's exactly the message. Nefertari, I'm going to get to you in a second, but Kaichi, in, um, we talked about the, the U.S. initiatives, the, the, the European initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, on your behalf of the Japanese groups and other Asian groups, we, we need to, uh, all patient populations, what, what are some of the initiatives that you're working on and leading as the IGCS president? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question, so thank you for asking that. Um, the, um, before I uh, answer to your question, uh, the, I w w want to mention one thing. When I started my training as a GYN doctor 40 years ago, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the, the, uh, the prevalence of the uterine cancer was two in 100,000 women, okay? Right. So now it's 20. Oh, wow. It's 10 times more patients. And the second thing I aware is about 20 years ago, I moved to the, um, the, the area where the medical care access is better to the worst part in Japan. And the, the, the proportion of the stage four uterine cancer was almost 20%. So it is amazing because when the, 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 the lady has the uh, atypical bleeding, there is no access. Okay. So, so I think uh, the, it is very, very important to, um, to raise awareness. This is the symptom. Or what or you want to see doctor, the G1 doctor. So, so I really want to um, reinforce our, this uh, movement together with the patients. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, so, so important. And um, to that point, you know, this is a global initiative. We recognize not only across countries, but um, access to care is a tremendous issue. We, under the IGCS leadership, we do a lot of educational programs. I'm involved with some tumor boards that we do in uh, low middle income countries in, in, um, throughout Asia and throughout Africa. We need to, you know, the, the level of care or the, the, the technical care that's, uh, that we have here in the U.S. and in Europe and in Japan may not be the same um, uh, uh, instrumentation, not the same robots and things that we have here, but we need to st still educate 
and improve the access to care. Mm -hmm. So a woman with abnormal bleeding can get biopsied. Maybe it's not with the same technical hysteroscopic biopsies we do, but they get biopsied. And if they need a hysterectomy they, or, or a surgical management for this disease, we in fact can do that. So it's not only giving the care, but it's giving a clear from, from a global perspective. Nefertari, I promise I'd get back to you. Um, in your community, if you have a loved one or a friend who's diagnosed with a cancer, how can you talk to them? I don't say convince them, but talk to them about the importance of research and the importance of getting the best possible care and advancing the science. Well, first, I really would start off with talking to them about my experience because, again, you know, I can relate not only, you know, just being a black woman, but having the diagnosis. Uh, and I think it's also important to know your community and to know how much, you know, where to start, and how much, you know, to talk to them about, you know, the educational aspect of it and what ways they can advocate for themselves, once again. Uh, and even just having representation, because lots of times, you know, trust is an issue. When we do have something going on with our bodies, you know, we feel like, you know, maybe we should just, you know, ignore it or wait to go to the doctor because maybe we won't be listened to. Uh, so I think just having, you know, someone that represents you even at whatever doctor's office or hospital that, you know, they're going to or is in their, you know, their neighborhood, uh, just, to, just for them to feel comfortable. And just having people such as, you know, from these advocacy groups out there in, in, in the community spreading that word so that they can, when they do uh, go to the doctor about in, something that's going on with them, they're able to, you know, say, okay, explain what's going on with them uh, and feel comfortable enough in doing so. So I would say, you know, that's another thing. And just also, uh, just again, as I know I said earlier, being aware of, you know, their body and also finding out their medical history as well. That's I, family. Oh, can I add, uh, I want to underline what you said. Patient advocacy group makes the difference mm -hmm. because they play a major role in orienteering the patient. Because in front of a diagnosis, we are completely destroyed. And if you, you lose your orienteering and patient advocacy group can help in moving the patient in the right direction. And they can play a major role also in the awareness. And awareness means not only I have a symptom, I have to move to my gynecologist. Awareness means also prevention. Because as Brian said, this is a tumor that can be prevented by physical activity, lifestyle behavior, reduce smoking, reduce eating, reduce fat. So we can impact on the incidence of tumor, simply change our lifetime style. And this is absolutely important and we need it's an agreement, uh, it's a coalition with the patient. We need your help uh, in, in fighting this disease. No, no, that's so true. And I think um, you, you're a leader in patient advocacy. One of the things that we're asking of you is to help make others patient advocates because we have to spread the word. You can't do everything. We can't do everything. We really want everyone to be a patient advocate. They're the captain of their yeah. ship. They have family and friends to spread the word about this and to say, you know what, going to the medical center is not that scary. And, you know, there's, it's easy, you know, they'll give you free parking and doing clinical trials and things like that. Those are just examples yeah. of some of the things um, uh, we need to do. Yes, ma'am. I just want to want to add something else. I think it should be like a collective, you know, effort even, you know, because a lot of times in some of these communities, you know, we live in a food desert, so it's easy to say, oh, keep down your weight or, you know, eat healthy or walk. So it's not like a lot of healthy food in a lot of the neighborhoods. So I think just bringing that aspect in as well to help to keep, you know, um, people healthy in terms of the foods that they eat um, and their weight and being active, you know, um, so the, I would say, again, that it should be a collective effort yep. as well. And I think that's part of our goal, right? Mm -hmm. I love the discussion today about the community engagement. I think there's so much that we can do in our communities, empower our advocacy groups, as you said, 
Keta and really get them um, behind this key messaging, I think is important. We've had a lot of media attention this week with our press release and really trying to drive uh, the media attention you know, towards this. I'm grateful for all the patient advocacy groups that have decided to partner with us. We are stronger and better together. I know that's a little cliche, but it's true in this instance. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for all of you for being here today to help us spread the word, so thank you. And, and we have a couple more questions, too. Oh, good. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, I don't want, no, th those are all tremendously important. But here's actually some great questions coming in. Um, next question is, how can we get more attention to fundraising to be directed towards uterine cancer research? Um, this is an international question. I'll, I'll start off in the U.S. We need to do a couple of things. Through awareness, we need to, um, simple things, walkathons, right? Do, doing fundraising events, doing galas in support of uterine cancer, um, selling t-shirts, and you know, the, the smaller events, um, we need to continue to push our larger industry partners to do events that are good for, for the public good. And you know, I think equally as important, we need to push our politicians. We need to get more government money for women's cancers in general, uterine cancer in particular. And that's another way, and a very important avenue in order to, to, to cure this disease is through the government-sponsored research as well. So um, it's not one thing or two things or three things. It's everything we could do. Um, and then you know, it, it's raising funds, particularly for, um, for research and for other initiatives. Um, Keta, what, what are you doing? Well, from fully agree, Brian, fully agree. And uh, I only add the thing. We realize that if we are together, we can perform faster clinical research. Mm -hmm. Faster clinical research means new opportunity for our patient, means new attention from the government, from the media, from the patient advocacy group. And we realize that if we are together, we can perform better. I completely agree, a thousand percent. Kaiji, how about um, raising funds and for, for in, in, in throughout Asia and Japan? Yeah, um, the, I think um, we have a very, very great network of the clinical research. However, to conduct the research, we need uh, the fund, funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the, I think the key is the help from the advocacy people because um, the, the government will listen more carefully from the patients than from the, the physicians. So, so I think uh, we really need help uh, from the, uh, the, the patients group. And uh, the, I, I think IGCS can internationally act yeah. to empower the, uh, the connection with the, uh, the patients and the physicians, uh, the, the researchers. Yeah, most definitely, in, in an inclusive way. We want to help co-lead with all these advocacy group yeah, organizations because right. um, we need their, their help in leading. Um, another great question, um, and Keta, I'm going to have you lead this one off. Many patients, including black women, are misdiagnosed. What is the current standard to diagnose endometrial cancer, um, for example, transvaginal ultrasound or biopsy? When What are you instructing your your generalists to do when the patient comes with abnormal bleeding? Oh, sure. Uh, for sure, uh, ultrasound evaluation may help, but the diagnosis at the end is histological. So you need to have a biopsy. Uh, ultrasound sometimes may be misleading because some of endometrial cancer arise on a thickness endometrium. But in other situations, we have small endometrium, and if we only stay on ultrasound, you miss diagnose a lot of tumors. So at the end, any time that the postmenopausal patient present bleeding, she should have hysteroscopy and biopsy. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. To add to that, hysteroscopy or another biopsy. Or not. Because from global initiatives, maybe some places they don't have that. Oh, but sure. But the, the most important is the biopsy, not, not necessarily the hysteroscopy. Yeah, no, I um, agree completely. Kate, anything to add there as far as um, any other um, diagnosis? And, you know, in, in, in hand in hand with that, we just got a question from France. First of all, who, um, those in France, thank you for staying up so late. <laughs> and, uh, we know that we're, it's an international press conference, so people are up early in the morning, late at night, and here in Chicago, it's um, a more reasonable time. But um, the question from France is many women, especially after menopause, it's not, they don't have easy access to gynecologists. Uh -huh. Is this a problem in other countries and other continents? What are your thoughts? Um, well, I, 
in, uh, at least in Japan, uh, the, we have the, the small clinics, uh, the G1 clinics, or the G1 clinics uh, the, in the town. Um, however, when we, we go to the rural area, uh, it is very, very difficult to get the, the good uh, the access to the, the G1 uh, doctor. And that's where education is so important. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't have access to doctors, if the patients and their communities knew that postmenopausal bleeding, and I'll take it a step further, premenopausal women can get endometrial cancer. So any abnormal bleeding, mm -hmm. if the, if, if, so that's an important point. But if, if there's abnormal bleeding in a premenopausal woman or postmenopausal, to educate those patients in the rural settings uh, right. to take a trip to the city clinics get in, get diagnosed, and get the appropriate care. Mm. Because we don't have the medical providers yeah. all over the place. How about, Kat, in Europe, how easy it is for, um, for someone to get in to see a gynecologist? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, but, uh, Brian, after the pandemic, uh, what we are seeing now uh, is more advanced tumor. Because during the pandemic, the hospital in Europe, but I think across all over the world, were fully committed in the treatment of COVID patient. And a lot of patients in front of bleeding uh, refused to move to the hospital because they were scared that there was no space for diagnosis. Uh, all the screening program were blocked and uh, what we are seeing now is more advanced tumor. But hopefully in the future we will uh, balance again uh, prevention and early diagnosis. And uh, I agree the key message is any abnormal bleeding should be indicated, should be indicated with a biopsy. Spot on. Postmenopausal yeah. and abnormal bleeding in premenopausal patients. Yeah. yeah. I think this is the part of the program where I get to plug the website. Let me, let me one, one oh, I, okay. I just want to get some positive comments. Don't let I me mean, not do that. We were supposed to, you know, you're, I'm going to turn it over in a second to Mary and Katie to, to, to finish up. This has really been such a great in, interaction. Um, uh, and then I'm going to have a question for you. So first we had some comments I just want to highlight. Someone said those points are so imperative, the points we highlighted to the collective call to action as a community of advocates and medical providers. So they thanked us, but thank you for listening and, and being here. Another comment, many thanks for this initiative. Uh, in France, again, thank you. When we asked women, we realized that none of them knew that uterine cancer was the most frequent among gynecologic cancers. Mm -hmm. Um, they agree that all women should know about this disease and know about the symptoms. UCAM is a fantastic opportunity. And before, Mary, I'm going to turn it over to you, but there's a question for Mary. Can any GYN cancer patient advocacy group join this campaign, and how can they get involved in the IGCS network and help spread the message this month? That's Great. awesome. Great question. Yeah, we welcome everyone, <laughs> every group. We did the best we could in kind of scouring the landscape and doing an environmental scan of who's out there right now currently doing um, uh, work in the space. Uh, we relied on some of our uh, pharmaceutical partners to tell us they know a lot about the advocacy groups and, and the space as well. The GOG was very helpful. So yes, anyone, please spread the word. We need as many people as possible as part of this fight. There's a role for everyone. And I'm grateful to my team who, it's one thing to have the idea, but it's another to execute and to do it so well. We have toolkits out on our website. There's uh, a lot of our board members are now translating the materials for us for their patients. We forget sometimes patients need translation. Yep. It's important. Mm -hmm. um, and also we've launched a video. Lots of social media, as I mentioned. There's so much happening. This is only the first of the month. Yep. We have a whole month to drive awareness, so I'm super excited about that as well. You, you mentioned your website. Do you want to remind the audience what the website is? Oh, yes. IGCS.org and then backslash UCAM is where you'll find the direct information. That's so, great. Thank you. I don't know, Kichi, anything uh, from you? Final well, words? The final words, I am so feel honored to be a president of the IGCS <laughs> right now. <laughs> so I, I am uh, here to serve all of their, their members and patience. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Kata, any final oh, yes. words for us? Mary, I, I dedicate my life to clinical research. I made a lot of difficult choice to pursue clinical research, but I have to say I'm so honored and so happy. We are privileged we, because we are living an unprecedented moment in clinical research in all GYM tumor and in endometrial cancer in particular. 
Nefertari, any closing comments? And then um, we, I think we'll open it up to questions from the floor as well. I would say, you know, still, you know, reiterate the importance of, uh, you know, awareness and listening to your body. And especially for me, for black women, you know, I want this message, you know, to reach as many black women and younger women uh, diagnosed with uh, uterine cancer. Uh, and also um, the importance of, you know, knowing or even asking about clinical trials when you, once you're diagnosed and learning your family history, talking to as many people, me, I talk to as many people as I can, family members, everyone about it, be, do, also due to my hereditary uh, uh, diagnosis uh, syndrome. So yeah, I would say, you know, just find out as much information as you can and just informing yourself, you know, is really important. And get with a supportive network as well, because most of us who have been diagnosed have never, you know, heard of uterine cancer and have never met another person with uterine cancer. So being a part of a support group is also, you know, really important and helpful. Such, and, such great yeah. comments. And again, thank you for having the strength to be here and to share your story. Um, any questions from the audience? Matt, you're a leading researcher in endometrial cancer. Any comments, questions? Yeah. Matt Powell, uh, uh, thanks, Mary, for uh, prompting me here. But fantastic <laughs> panel, and I think some of the things that have been mentioned is, uh, as Katie said, four different types of endometrial cancer. Gee, this seems to be getting more and more complicated. Mm. It's uh, the racial disparities, and so who should patients see when they have these problems? I'll take um, no thank <laughs> Matt. Matt, for, thanks for that question. Um, um, the answer is yes. They should see someone. Right, so um, part of our education, I mentioned this, it's not only teaching our patients and their families, but it's teaching our, um, our colleagues, right? Our nurse practitioners, mm. our nurses, the nurse who, the, the, the administrative assistant who answers the phone. Not to say, well, yes, you need to come in and see a doctor. You need to come and see the nurse practitioner this week or next. You need, oh, there's something strange going on. You need to see Dr. Ketta, or you need to come and see your gynecologist, but get in quickly. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, you know, sometimes in areas where there's, at least in the U.S., where there's not a gynecologist, um, a lot of our family practice doctors, our family practice nurse practitioners, our internists, have the ability to see patients and at least refer um, to, to get the appropriate care. But that's a great question. Is it really like Natari's uh, comment that continue to advocate for yourself? Mm -hmm. And I think if you continue to have problems, even if you had reassurance, keep going back and, and saying, I'm still having this problem, because we do see that People often are mm -hmm. neglected initially and, and uh, need that continued reminder to their provider that this needs to be worked up and a biopsy is necessary. Great. Great. Dr. Copeland, you're the president of the GOG Foundation and um, really lead our efforts in, in, in research. So comments? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so um, you know, with all of our GYN cancers, we're, we're trying to um, tr transform the standard of care, which is our mission. Um, convincing patients to go on trials is not always easy, it, especially perhaps minority patients. They're, they're a little hesitant and mistrusting of the medical si system for good reason, I might add. Um, but, but the um, message must be delivered to them that um, clinical trials offer you the opportunity mm -hmm. to get tomorrow's treatment today. And uh, Keta just mentioned the two big positive trials that were presented in March. And uh, hundreds of patients got tomorrow's treatment a few years ago. And so that message has to be very loud and clear to these patients who have the challenge of the cancer. I think we just got next year's campaign theme. What do you think? <laughs> No, I mean, research, patients who participate in clinical trials we know do better than those who don't. And we understand that clinical trials are not always available to all patients, but um, sometimes it's the patient asking. The patient saying, well, I want a clinical trial. And then the doctor who's treating will say, well, we may not have it, but across the street or across town at the other hospital, they have it. And it's important to have to teach our colleagues, the medical providers, that it is a collegial environment and that we're not looking for to, to, to put patients on research for any other reason. There's no other reason except to help them do better clinically. 
And Brian, if I can add, the awareness is important also from this point of view. And patient advocacy group are important also from this point of view because a few years ago, the clinical trial was uh, an experiment. I, I remember some discussion with the patient when I proposed a clinical trial. They said, I'm not a caveat. I don't want to be part of an experiment. Now, the information, the education changed the mind and patients are requiring clinical trial and it's important to educate because a patient in a clinical trial live longer, receive today the treatment of tomorrow. I love this sentence. I will use in my yeah, <laughs> in my yeah, next yeah. discussion with the patient. He always has the right things. Yeah. <laughs> At the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And they provide important information. They are part of the change. Uh, and this is important 100%. to know. Yeah. No, that, that's a great comment. And um, um, one other, I mean, we're getting great comments here. So I have another question. Actually, this is a question that comes in from Nigeria. So we really have a worldwide reach here with this press conference. And thank you for, I guess you're staying up very late there as well, so, so thank you. Um, the advocacy on uterine cancer in Nigeria is very low, and many cases are presented very late. Thus, ignorance remains the underlying risk factor for most Nigerian women. And I, I don't want to say ignorance, it's maybe just um, lack of knowledge or lack of care, but you know, we, we're, um, the, the lack of getting, in, uh, of getting to the doctor. Mary, how will this advocacy in particular, benefit Nigerian women. I could say Mary is CEO. She's all over the world, right? Whenever I, I we, she and I talk to each other, you know, weekly, if not more often, and it's not hi, it's what country are you in now? <laughs> Spreading the word. So Mary, how, do, how, how are we doing this in, in Nigeria? How are you helping to lead this effort? It's important. I know um, we talked a lot today about the U.S. and some of the data and statistics, but it is a global problem, and we have to handle things differently in other parts of the world, and I believe like cervix cancer, it's getting its time now in some of these places. They're raising the awareness of cervix cancer. Obviously, there's vaccination, screening. I think we have to do the same with uterine cancer. We have to drive the awareness of it. We need to bring women together to talk about some of their things. I think Nefetari mentioned peer groups, focus groups. They have to feel comfortable in this space because not every part of the world welcomes women mm -hmm. to talk about their illness, their disease, their symptoms. It's gonna take time, but I think we should set our, a bar for this. And hopefully every year we're going to start to see the needle move. We'll get a little bit higher in raising awareness, having the dialogue. But I'm so grateful for IGCS and for the opportunity that we all get to do this together. Yeah, yeah. Spot on. And our commitment here is to say, this is just the start. This year we're going to educate, we're going to define, we're going to let people know what's going on. And I said earlier, um, this is going to be a sustained campaign, and we're looking forward to five, six years from now, if not sooner, saying that the number of deaths due to uterine cancer are decreasing. And one great reason for that is through the awareness and through the patients and their families fighting and educating to help people live longer. Yeah. Great. So this has been great. Um, uh, absolutely. I'd like Debbie to come up. I want everyone on Zoom to see you, Debbie. <laughs> you have been the, the, the workhorse behind this. I know that you have so much passion for this. And everyone on Zoom I know knows you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, so Thank much. You. Thanks, Debbie. Great. Great. Thanks for being here, and have a great rest of your yeah, day. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. thank you very much. Thank you so much.